his mic open and we're talking. You want that off? You don't have to go and turn the mic off. The binoculars come out here. And this, the other side does the same thing. It's a momentary. You see. times for me and that's about it so so being in for general farrell i usually have prep general farrell on some of our things oh i haven't i haven't testified at any
quorum being present, the Subcommittee on National Security and Foreign Affairs hearing entitled Made in the USA, Manufacturing Policy, the Defense Industrial Base and United States National Security will come to order. I ask unanimous consent that only the Chairman and Ranking Member, Mr. Foster, of the Subcommittee be allowed to make opening statements. Without objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that the hearing record be kept open for five business days so that all members of the Subcommittee will be allowed to submit a written statement for the record. Without objection, that is so ordered as well. So again, good morning, and uh, thanks to all our witnesses for being here. Today the Subcommittee turns its attention to a matter that has far-reaching consequences for both our economy and our national security, the United States manufacturing and defense industrial base. For decades, manufacturing has been the backbone of the American economy. Uh, the United States has been known as the land of innovation, the home of the car, the computer, and the jet plane. These innovations lead to good jobs for hardworking Americans. American manufacturing is also a bastion of quality where the words made in America signify superior craftsmanship, durability, and value. However, despite the importance of innovation and manufacturing to our national economy, manufacturing jobs have been dropping steadily over the last several decades. Right after World War II, manufacturing accounted for 40 percent of the American jobs. Today that number is closer to 11 percent. While the decrease in manufacturing affects many aspects of the United States economy, Today we will focus on one area in particular, the defense industrial base. The decrease in manufacturing at home has forced the Department of Defense to look abroad to acquire the tools it needs to arm our forces and provide for our national security. Outsourcing takes control of our supply chain out of our hands, and when foreign companies or governments control the production of necessary parts, our critical defense needs are subject to geopolitical forces that are beyond our control. Now, as far back as May of 2003 in the 108th Congress, uh, I have been focusing on this issue, and I remember that during consideration of the fiscal year 2004 Defense Authorization Bill, I offered an amendment that sought to expand the scope of the Defense Industrial Base Assessment Program, and it was included in the committee-approved bill. Uh, it required additional information on why contracts are transferred outside inside this country. It would have mandated an action plan on how our defense manufacturing sector can be revitalized and restored. In fact, the amendment was approved by a voice vote and it had the support of the then Chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, uh, Republican Duncan Hunter. But uh, the opposition from the Bush administration caused it to be stripped from the final version, and the regrettable effect of that was that the Defense Industrial Base Assessment Program wasn't nearly as effective as I think it should have been. The following year, I went a step further and I offered an amendment to the fiscal year 2005 Defense Authorization Bill that was aimed at keeping taxpayer-supported defense jobs here in this country. Uh, my amendment would have required the Secretary of Defense, as a condition of any defense-related manufacturing contract, to mandate that the contract perform substantially all or in no event less than 65 percent of defense-related manufacturing services in the United States. The provision allowed the Secretary of Defense to waive that requirement in cases where the products and services were not available in the United States or if national security concerns necessitated a waiver. Unfortunately, the then Republican-led Rules Committee prevented the amendment from receiving a vote on the House floor. But we have had a number of examples uh, where have, uh, relying on foreign uh, companies has been detrimental. For example, in 2003, a Swiss company decided to delay delivery of essential parts of the Pentagon's Joint Direct Attack Munitions, the JDAMs, commonly known as smart bombs due to their ability to pinpoint targets, because of Swiss government's opposition to the Iraq War. Not only did this force the Defense Department to acquire these parts at a higher price, there was a significant delay in getting these munitions to our forces overseas. Further, it is only when critical parts are made in America that we can be sure that the quality meets our needs. There have been countless situations where the Department of Defense has received foreign parts that did not meet its quality standards, including substandard and counterfeit materials. In one example, seat belt class purchased by the United States Army would break when it accidentally dropped because they were fabricated from a substandard grade of aluminum. One particularly salient example of our dependence on foreign countries to supply us with essential materials used for defense is our need for rare earth materials. These metals are used for making a wide range of commercial and defense applications, including the engines of the F-14, F-15, F-16 fighter jets. Such materials are also critical components of high-tech computer chips, cell phones, and smart bombs that are hallmarks of warfighting in the information age. China produces and therefore controls 97 percent of rare earth oxides. It would take about 15 years to establish a domestic supply chain and the national security implications of this imbalance are impossible to ignore. We also face significant workforce training and capacity issues. 
The Government Accountability Office has consistently reported that there are not enough likely, highly skilled workers to perform the critical tasks needed to sustain our industrial base. We have more people retiring than entering the workforce, which means companies that want to build in America, in America cannot find workers with the right skills to do so. As such, we will have to invest in our education system as well as our training programs. We must also look at our manufacturing capacity and ensure that we have modern, technologically advanced facilities that can respond to both civilian and defense needs. We need smart policies that assure that a skilled manufacturing workforce has the flexible capacity to shift between defense, public works, and commercial activity as the times demand. Creating a robust manufacturing sector also requires careful consideration of tax, trade, innovation, and regulatory policies. I want to stress that this is not about protectionism or stifling free trade. It's about being competitive. I applaud the House for passing H.R. 4692, which would require each President to develop a national manufacturing strategy and assess progress. I encourage the Senate to do the same. We can no longer afford to jeopardize our economy, the livelihood of Americans, or our national security by ignoring the manufacturing sector. Modernizing and improving our industrial base will ultimately improve our economy, provide better employment opportunities to Americans, and strengthen national security. We have to start to think strategically about the industrial challenges we face and take aggressive action to fully address them. Our economic and national security demand it. And with that, I'd like to ask Mr. Lukemeyer for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, welcome to our panelists today. Uh, the debate today raises important questions about how traditional free market principles coincide with national security concerns. While the United States sometimes relies on foreign labor and equipment because they can provide cheaper alternatives to domestic sources, the result at times can be less than ideal. The sensitive and quality of foreign-made equipment are valid concerns. Does this mean that all military equipment should be produced within the United States? We should consider whether a logical balance can be struck. Sensitive equipment should be made either in the United States or in collaboration with our closest allies. For non-sensitive equipment, we should employ greater quality controls and more stringent oversight of foreign products. I believe we should step up, should go a step further and examine the policies that drive business offshore to begin with. We should examine whether Congress and administration need to reform corporate tax rates, labor policies, and environmental regulations so that they are conducive to domestic industrial growth. Creating an environment within which businesses will naturally thrive will go a long way toward bolstering the domestic industrial base. Whichever path we take, we must also be mindful of likely retaliation as a factor if we choose a path that many of our, that may, that many of our trading partners will construe as protectionist and violation of international trade agreements. Mr. Chairman, thank you for uh, coming to this hearing. I look forward to today's testimony. Thank you. Uh, the committee, subcommittee will now receive testimony from the panel before us today. Oh, uh, before we do that even, Mr. Foster has an opening statement. Mr. Foster, we invite you to present yeah, that. I'd like to um, thank the Chairman, and I'd also like to introduce um, a graph, which I think often a picture is worth um, tens of thousands of words, and, and this graph, which will, um, I hope is, will be visible to our panel. Without is, objection, it's entered on the record. Um, th this is simply a, a plot of manufacturing employment in the United States from 1973 till today. And it, remarkably, um, it was remarkably constant for 30 years from um, the early 70s until early 2001. It was um, basically 17 to 18 million. Didn't matter, um, didn't matter who was in charge, good times and bad, Democrats, Republicans, um, it was it was relatively healthy during this period. Um, of course, industrial output more than doubled because of increases in productivity and technology. Um, but in early 2001, a cataclysm overtook us, and uh, more than a third of our manufacturing jobs have been lost. Um, and this um, is not and should not be a partisan issue. Um, we were able we were able for decades to keep healthy manufacturing um, going in the United States. Um, of course, businesses grew, businesses failed failed, sectors increased and decreased, um, but overall um, we stayed relatively healthy. But something very bad happened starting in early 2001, and as a country we have to understand what it was that did that. It, it wasn't a single cause, it was a number of things. We have to understand how to, to reverse this. Um, and I, I, as someone who started a manufacturing company when I was 19, actually back right around 1973, I started a company that now provides hundreds of manufacturing jobs in the Midwest and has uh, competed and exports a very high fraction of our production. 
and we are faced um, every single trade show we go to. We are worried that one of our uh, competitors will have offshored their production and be undercutting us. And so we have to understand things like currency manipulation that we ought to be able to fix, and things like labor arbitrage, which are going to be very tough. And so we have to have an honest national discussion about this, and we have to decide what fraction of things like national defense frankly trump um, you know, mindless free trade um, points of view, and that there would be certain things that we're going to have to be able to do. It has to be a national goal that after an electromagnetic pulse event that wipes out all of our electronics, that we have the ability by ourselves to recover our capacity to communicate in this country. And things like that have to be thought out and very consciously separated. Anyway, this is a wonderful hearing, and I thank the Chairman for having it. Thank you, Mr. Foster. Uh, now the subcommittee will receive testimony from the panel before us today. Uh, first, I'll introduce the panel. Mr. Jeff Foe is the founding president and a distinguished fellow at the Economic Policy Institute. Mr. Foe has studied, taught, and published on a wide variety of economic and political issues and is the author or co-author of five books. He also has worked as an economist in the Departments of State, Labor, and Commerce, as a manager in the finance industry, as a blueberry farmer, and as a member of the Municipal Planning Board in the State of Maine. He sits on the boards of several nonprofit institutions and magazines, has written articles for numerous newspapers and journals, and regularly appears on television and radio. Mr. Foe holds a BA from Queens College, an MA from George Washington University, and an honorary degree from the University of New England. Mr. Robert Baugh is the Executive Director of the Industrial Union Council of the American Federation of Labor and Congress of Industrial Organizations, or the AFL-CIO. The Council, comprised of the nation's leading industrial unions and chaired by the AFL-CIO AFL President, is the coordinating body for the AFL-CIO's manufacturing policy and legislative initiatives. Mr. Barr is also the co-chair of the AFL-CIO Energy Task Force and served as the leader of the United States Labor Delegation to the UN Climate Change Conference negotiations in Bali, Boston, and Copenhagen. Mr. Barr is also the author of several publications on issues ranging from economic development to manufacturing and climate change. He holds a BA from the University of Detroit and an MA in Industrial and Labor Relations from the University of Oregon. Mr. Mark Gordon serves as the Executive Committee on the Executive Committee of the National Defense Industrial Association and is the Director for Defense Programs at the National Center for Advanced Technologies, where he covers all technology, manufacturing, and research and development policy topics. He also heads the Evolutionary Acquisition Training Team, which provides an industry perspective to the Department of Defense technical and policy groups on acquisition policy. Additionally, Mr. Gordon sits on the Joint Defense Manufacturing Technology Panel as the defense industry representative and as a member of the Diminishing Manufacturing Sources and Material Shortages Working Group on the Department of Defense. He is a board member of the National Center for the Defense Manufacturing and Machining and a member of the National Defense Industry Association Manufacturing Division Executive Committee. For the purposes of full disclosure, Mr. Gordon is also under government contract as an industry liaison for strategic planning initiatives involving, involving technology transition mechanisms within the Department of Defense. He holds a Mr. and an MA from the Georgia Institute of Technology. Mr. Michael Wessel is a member of the United States Chomic and Security Review Commission a senior advisor at the Alliance for American Manufacturing and president of the Wessel Group, a public affairs consulting firm. He is also a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, a staff advisor to the Labor Advisory Committee to the United States Trade Representative, and previously served on the United States Trade Deficit Review Commission from 1999 to 2000. Mr. Wessel worked for House Majority Leader Richard Gephardt for more than 20 years. In addition to serving as general counsel, he also served as Mr. Gephardt's principal ways and means aide, participating in the enactment of major trade policy initiatives and as the Executive Director of the House Trade and Competitive Task Force. Mr. Wessel holds a BA and a JD from George Washington University. So thank you to all of our witnesses for making yourselves available today and for sharing your substantial expertise. It's the policy of this committee to square you in before you testify, so I ask that you please stand and raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. The, the record will please reflect that all the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, we can advise you that your full written statement will be entered into the record. I thank all of you for substantial written statements that were uh, very informative and ask if you might keep your opening remarks to approximately five minutes so that we can get a good uh, series of rounds of questions and answers on that. Uh, Mr. Foe, we'll start with you, please. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for holding this uh, hearing on such a vital and often ignored uh, national issue. And, uh, 
Mr. Foster and Mr. Lukemeyer and the rest of the subcommittee for inviting me to share my thoughts uh, and concerns. It seems self-evident to many people, most people, I think, that a healthy industrial base is essential to our national defense. Yet over the last several decades, we have followed a national policy of allowing that base to deteriorate with little regard for our future. As a result, our supply lines for strategic parts and materials are stretched around the world. The pool of domestic workers with high-tech industrial skills needed in future national emergencies has been allowed to drain. We have accumulated massive overseas debt to China because of our trade deficit and other creditor nations that is a potential economic and national security threat. And many American manufacturing corporations, including those producing advanced technology products, now see their future and disturbingly perhaps in the, in the future their corporate loyalties elsewhere. Now in this country we have a long successful history dating to the beginning of the Republic of government encouraging and guiding the private sector to build and maintain a strong manufacturing base in support of national goals. But beginning uh, in the 1980s, administrations headed by both parties have slowly adopted the posture that a strong industrial base is, in effect, not the public's business. Leave it all to the market. The problem is that the market is essentially indifferent to our country's national security. And the global market, subject to currency manipulation, mercantilist trade policies, and similar practices by potentially rival states can be hostile. To its credit, the current administration and Congress uh, recognize some of this and are beginning to make important initiatives. But they're still in the country and in the government and in our political discussions that we uh, listen to every day on television and, and, and radio. There's a sense of, there's a lack of a sense of urgency about this. Ironically, we have had a sort of industrial policy over the last several decades. But the favorite industry has not been manufacturing, but finance. So it's no surprise that while our goods markets have shrunk, we lead the world in the finance sector's major product, debt. Offshoring and downsizing manufacturing may often be in the short-run financial interests of the average investor, but at a heavy cost to the long-term interests of the average American citizen. One result of these imbalanced policies has been a continuous trade deficit for 30 years after having 100 years of trade surpluses and balance, and a growing deficit in high technology products for the last 12. Yes, we have a trade surplus in high technology services, but that is not necessarily good news. It represents the relentless transfer of advanced skills and knowledge to other nations. This experience, as well as economic common sense, tells us that without government leadership, private investors will not largely make the long-term commitment necessary to rebuild and retool a competitive manufacturing sector. There is no one single magic bullet that will solve this problem. We need a variety of mutually reinforcing trade, tax, procurement, currency adjustment, and other policies. But today, our economic and national security policies are too often made in separate, multiply unconnected silos. For example, there is now wide agreement that government should finance more high-tech research and development. But without a policy to assure that the products that are generated are made in the United States, it will end up subsidizing the future economies and strengthening the global power of other nations at our taxpayers' expense. Another set of silos are our policies toward China. For 20 years, one part of the government has been helping build up China's high-tech industrial capacity, while another part of the government is practicing for future contract, co conflict. Taken separately, each policy might be rationalized, but taken together, they make no sense at all. My testimony outlines a few suggestions on how we might begin to organize for more integration of our policies, including a presidential commission on look linking the two areas, the appointment of select committees 
uh, in Congress to deal with integrated global strategies. But whatever the most effective organizational structure, the most important point is that we urgently need an integrated national industrial strategy to promote a future for Americans that is both prosperous and secure. And my fear, Mr. Chairman, is that the time may be running out. Thank you again for taking the leadership on this issue, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you, Mr. Foy. I appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Ba? Thank you, Chairman Tierney and members of the committee for inviting me here tomorrow, this morning to testify on this important subject. Uh, we believe the decade-long decline in the American manufacturing base is a crisis that has undermined our economic security and national security and subscribe to all the comments that were made by members of the panel this morning. Uh, the question before us is what has happened to that prosperity and security and what must be due to strengthen the nation's industrial base. I would like to make three main points in this testimony. One, the health of our manufacturing base and the health of our defense industrial base are one and the same, and the diagnosis is critical. Our own trade, number two, our own trade tax and investment and procurement policies and the globalization of production has helped create this situation. And three, it simply doesn't have to be this way. There are steps we can and we must take to revitalize our manufacturing base and our national security with policies, investments, and incentives we enact that must be both strategic and employment linked. To Jeff's point a moment ago on research and development policy. Um, for the American manufacturing communities, this recession has just been one more big wave in a decade of economic tsunamis. Uh, Mr. Foster, your chart says it all. In a little more than a decade, we lost six million manufacturing jobs, one-third of our manufacturing jobs. 57,000 facilities closed. And I would make note, I'm not just speaking for the frontline skilled workers, but I'm talking about a million of those jobs that were engineers, designers, developers, scientists, the very core of our professional and technical capacity for innovation in this nation lost their jobs. They are out of that market. That is part of our future, and we have been wasting it away. It is a myth to think that the manufacturing base and the defense industrial base are somehow separate and independent. The natural, the national resource, natural, excuse me, the National Research Council has made this point over and over, and it is in the other papers we submitted as part of our testimony, the manufacturing and security paper, that documents critical industries, critical technologies that are fading away from our economy and our expertise. And your point on the uh, uh, that was made about the. Uh, the metals is absolutely correct and straightforward and something is very serious and strategic consequences when China could get for those rare earth metals. Import penetration studies by the U.S. Business and Industry Council parallel this and show uh, the degree of import penetration into the U.S. economy. It's dominated in 27 of 114 sectors. Over 50 percent of our consumption is of imports in manufactured materials, and this shows up. These are global trends and these are economic trends that are a disaster for this country. The military policies of dual use have helped do this because we seek the cheapest vendor, the cheapest product. We find decisions made by the Navy to lease vessels rather than make them to the Coast Guard to make ship parts over in Korea and just assemble them here. It diminishes our capacity to address these things in the future. The threatened closures of Avondale and Ingalls shipyard are, are point, a case in point. While we've had these warnings from the, natural, the uh, National Research Council, I think what's more poignant is watching how research and development innovation has been offshored. And nothing is more striking than the recent announcement by Intel and Applied Materials and other major technological innovators in our, in our economy that have gotten billions of dollars of illegal subsidies and have opened major facilities in China. These are the same products that will come back to haunt us, as they already do in so many other fields. Our trade deficits, as Jeff has pointed out, are symptomatic of the rot eating away at our industrial base. The Economic Policy Institute estimates that we've lost up to 2.4 million jobs to China alone from this. And what do we know about China's strategy? Well, they target industries, they target technologies, they back it with a whole series of illegal trade practices, the leading one of which we are talking about in this Congress, and that is currency manipulation. And it is time we do something about it. A 40 percent subsidy goes a long way. It not only subsidizes the issue of things that are imported into our economy, more importantly, it subsidizes the research and development that's going into their economy from American firms and other international corporations. We need today to take action to end currency manipulation, and House Bill 2378 does that, and this Congress should move on it immediately. 
the Ways and Means Committee has had it under consideration, and we had a, a hearing on it just this uh, last week. The Congress has made important steps, as was noted in the Chairman's testimony, uh, the idea that we actually need a national manufacturing strategy, that we need a trade deficit commission, that we need to take these steps forward to address a manufacturing strategy for the nation. Every other country in the world has one, and it's focused on employment and income. We do not. Shame on us. Shame on us. It's part of our problem. What you have done so far is a start, but we need to do much, much more. And we need policies and incentives, as I said before, that are strategic and employment linked. And we don't necessarily have that in the case. It is a silo effect that uh, Dr. Foe is talking about. It is the idea that the one hand doesn't see what the other is doing here as, as we move on these things. We put a good policy in place around energy for clean energy production but it's not employment linked, and therefore we stand to spend a good portion of that resource on foreign corporations producing these things. We have to be more strategic in how we do this. There are six things we need to do. One is about bringing fairness uh, to the global economy. And that strengthens our laws. It means we practice by America, but it means we enforce our trade laws. We do something about currency. We must invest massively in this nation's infrastructure, not only just to bring it up to speed, but for the future. And we should do that strategically with employment link policies that, in fact, make the technologies and the things that we're going to build our country with. And the same thing needs to happen in the field of energy and our infrastructure. Again, 48C, 130, uh, Section 136 for autos. The idea that we are going to have loan guarantees and these things that invest in the American economy are technologies that we used to lead the world in and we no longer do. And we need to invest in these things and recapture that. It's about revitalizing the manufacturing base that protects our defense industrial base. We need tax policies that encourage investment. As Mr. Luchtemeyer talked about, we agree with you on that. We also need to get rid of the tax policies that are incentives for offshoring work. I think we have conflicting ideologies on this that we need to fix and address in terms of a strategy. And we must protect innovation and we must invest in our R&D so that things are made here. And finally, we absolutely have to have a skilled and trained workforce for our future. As I said at the beginning, the health of our economy and our national security are inextricably tied together, and we must have a vibrant manufacturing sector to make sure it works. We must revive manufacturing as a clear centerpiece of our nation's economic and national security strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bob. Mr. Gordon. Uh, Chairman Tierney and members of the committee, on behalf of our members, uh, 1,700 corporate and 83,000 uh, individual members, I'm pleased to appear before uh, the House Subcommittee on National Security and Foreign Affairs today to discuss the national security implications of the U.S. manufacturing policy and to present several recommendations to improve that policy. Succinctly, the U.S. manufacturing sector is of vital importance to our country, given its enormous impact um, across the fundamental underpinnings of our nation's security, both economic and defense-related. Manufacturing remains the largest productive center, uh, sector in the overall economy at 12 percent, and the U.S. produces more goods than any other country, although it's close. Manu manufactured goods also represent 50 percent of the country's exports, limiting the deficit in our balance of trade. And to further bolster its importance, manufacturing generates a substantial benefit from other uh, economic sectors, multiplying each dollar spent within the sector of manufacturing into an additional $1.41 in other um, sectors, higher than any other one. This raises the complete impact from the manufacturing sector to one quarter of our GDP. An often overlooked aspect of manufacturing is not simply the size of the sector, but the fact that manufacturing creates wealth within the U.S. by producing something of higher value from materials or components. There's only three ways of creating wealth, dig it up, grow it, or make it. And unlike other wealth-creating sectors, manufacturing jobs are generally high-paying and represent an entree into the middle class for a large portion of the workforce. Our national security depends heavily upon our domestic manufacturing capabilities. The DOD replies, uh, relies upon the industrial base for leap-ahead, innovative technologies to provide combat overmatch for our warfighters, and upon trusted domestic suppliers to deliver on time and at quality. In my testimony today, I'd like to discuss four main themes vital to manufacturing policy. Leadership, research and development, strategic capabilities, and then workforce and infrastructure. Defense manufacturing capabilities have, uh, have to be elevated to a higher level in the scope of U.S. policy considerations, and this requires active and senior leadership. To crystallize this point, let me make a simple comparison. 
The agriculture sector represents 1 percent of GDP, employs 1 percent of the workforce, and is represented by a Cabinet Secretary. The manufacturing sector is 10 times larger and is represented by an Assistant Secretary for Manufacturing and Services within the International Trade Administration of the Department of Commerce. In turn, defense manufacturing issues need more senior leadership within the Department of Defense to unite policy, strategy, investment, and implementation. This is a strategic requirement above all others, and I have recently seen congressional language on this topic. Manufacturing research and development is literally the core of our national engine. Seventy percent of R&D in the U.S. is performed by manufacturing com uh, companies, and the technology and innovation results will make the U.S. more competitive, but only if the results of the R&D stay in the U.S. and add to the GDP. Put simply, if R&D stays within the U.S., it represents an investment for us. If it goes offshore, it represents simply a cost, and the country gains little benefit from the R&D. Turning to national um, to R&D for national security, the DOD has a single program that is chartered under USC Title X to develop and transition manufacturing capabilities for defense systems, the DOD Mantech program. This program has recently delivered to Congress <clears throat> a strategic plan uh, titled Delivering a Defense Affordability with Four Strategic Thrusts, and I have referenced the executive summary with my testimony today. However, more investment is needed. A Defense Science Board study recently concluded that the proper investment level for Mantech should be 1 percent of RDT&E, a three times increase. Now, for strategic considerations, one of the most critical balancing acts that we heard today is uh, within industrial policy is between open competition and active support or subsidy of an industry capability. Industrial capabilities in manufacturing processes, raw materials, components, and technologies are disappearing from the U.S. every day, and while some can be replaced with overseas suppliers, this is not possible for defense essential needs, where access to domestic sources is a national security requirement. Therefore, when absolutely necessary, the Department will intervene to create or sustain essential manufacturing capabilities. There is a program, the Defense Production Act, that needs to be adequately funded and fully utilized across the whole of government in order to help this. Other strategic needs are the need for uh, steady long-term access to affordable raw materials, counterfeit parts, environmental regulations, and visibility into the lower levels of the supply chain. An NDIA white paper titled Maintaining a, Vi uh, a Viable Defense Industrial Base lays out the technical challenges and policy opportunities for each of these issues. Finally, advanced manufacturing technologies require a workforce with core technology skills and an updated industrial infrastructure that is highly connected and enterprise-driven for the future of the U.S. An effective role for the defense industry would be as a first adopter for many of these enterprise-level advanced manufacturing practices, which would then transition to the domestic manufacturing base and help strategically position the U.S. in the increasingly hyper-competitive global economy. Uh, Chairman Tier uh, Tierney, I'm honored to have this uh, opportunity to provide you with uh, an industry perspective on the critical nature of manufacturing and be willing to ask, available to answer your questions. Thank you, Mr. Gordon. Uh, Mr. Wessel, your remarks, please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Lukemeyer, other members of the committee for the invitation to be here this morning and um, want to testify on this important topic. Uh, first, the general disclaimer, I am here today in my individual capacity and any views I express are my own. Uh, but as a commissioner on the U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission, let me highlight that in most of the past several years, we have issued unanimous reports by the six Democratic and six Republican commissioners. Confronting our national and economic security does not have to divide us, and it can unite us in terms of moving forward. Our national security interests have changed dramatically over the years. But while cyberspace and the electronic spectrum are increasingly important to our national security interests, there will still be a need for a U.S. presence around the globe. The requirement for actual boots on the ground will not disappear. Made in the USA may, in fact, be more important than it has ever been. The globalization of supply chains and the decimation of our manufacturing base have already put our interests at risk. We no longer produce enough ammunition for our troops and law enforcement. Reports are that there is no longer a domestic supplier for the propellant used in Hellfire missiles. As you noted, Mr. Chairman, we uh, are uh, dramatically uh, undermined uh, by Chinese policies regarding to rare earth minerals that we need in JDAMs and smart bombs. 
And as you also noted, Mr. Chairman, um, as we look at how other countries approach these issues, uh, you mentioned the Switzerland example. But also, France refused to grant the U.S. overflight rights for the bombing run on Libya. Turkey denied U.S. combat troops access to a northern evasion route in the run-up to the Iraq war. What would happen on a broader and longer-term basis if other countries followed their example and limited our supply of spare parts, basic components, or full weapon systems? The risks to our national security run far deeper. The first salvos in our next conflict may be lobbed in bits, bytes, and bots. The electronic spectrum is key to everything we do, and technology must be part of a secure and reliable supply chain. The growing risks that result from too many of our companies and our military abandoning the Made in America logo have increased dramatically. As the U.S. has outsourced and offshored its production, we are increasing our security risks. We aren't just letting the fox guard the hen house. We are inviting the fox to the dinner table. Several years ago, there was a plan to procure Chinese-produced Lenovo computers for our classified systems. This would have been a huge opportunity for their intelligence services. Our procurement officials weren't originally even cognizant of the original problem. Afterwards, promises were made to update GSA's procurement regs, but to date, I'm unaware of any real change in that area. Indeed, one government entity that I'm aware of that has to go unnamed recently had to seek a specific clause in a contract with a previously cleared government contractor to ensure that equipment by the Chinese state-owned telecommunications firm Huawei was excluded from its system. Despite ongoing and increasing concerns about Huawei's activities, the Chinese technology giant continues to supply telecommunications equipment across the country for networks that could carry U.S. government traffic or other critical traffic. The risks from the globalization of supply chains in the technology area are clear. Our military and our nation's critical infrastructure are completely dependent on computers and the Internet, and they are vulnerable. As manufacturing capabilities move offshore, the basic skills of our workers are put at risk. The skills of such workers are too often taken for granted. And the decimation of our manufacturing base has an enormous impact on the strength of our economy, which is directly related to our national security. Let me quickly highlight three areas for action. First, in the trade area, we need to update and reform our nation's trade policies to make them results-oriented. We cannot afford to look the other way when our rights and the commitments that our trading partners have made are violated. As has been already noted, the failure to deal with China's uh, manipulation of a currency is a perfect example of this problem. It's as much as a 40 percent subsidy for their exports and a 40 percent tax on our goods going there. How can U.S. manufacturers compete against those margins, not to mention other subsidies and predatory practices? The resulting shift in production poses risks to our national security. But by failing to address China's currency manipulation, we are also helping to fund China's massive buildup in advanced weaponry and strengthening its leadership. In procurement, we should use the leverage of our procurement dollars to support the revitalization of manufacturing sector and defense industrial base. Buy American policies are consistent with our international commitments and should be aggressively pursued as part of our procurement efforts, not only to help revitalize our manufacturing and defense industrial base, but to advance our security interests. We also need an assessment of where our defense dollars are actually going and how the globalization of supply chains may threaten our interests. And we need to do a better job of focusing our tax and economic policies on revitalizing our nation's manufacturing and industrial base through R&D. We should extend the R&D credit to first stage deployment in domestic facilities so that products produced with taxpayer subsidized research are actually produced here. As well, we need to examine what the migration overseas of American R&D and production by some of our companies is doing to undermine our manufacturing and defense industrial base here and enhancing the capabilities of others. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning, and I look forward to your questions and working with you and your staffs in the future. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Wessel. Thank all of our panelists for uh, very good testimony as well as the written comments that you supplied earlier. We're going to go to our question and answer period, uh, five minutes per member on that, and, and probably more than one round if you'll bear with us on that. 
Uh, the United States Business and Industrial Council, a paper that was presented with some of the remarks here today, uh, talked about import penetration. Uh, Mr. Barr, I think you made mention of that report in there. One of the quotes is that high import penetration continues to, to deny the stimulus-supported U.S. economy of major private sector growth and employment opportunities. Better control of the United States imports could have boosted domestic manufacturing output and overall growth by as much as $404.59 billion in 2008 alone in the 114 capital and tactical technology-intensive manufacturing sectors examined. Uh, in essence, it is easier to sell into one's own domestic market than it is into a foreign market. So uh, tell me, Mr. Barr, if you would, uh, how does one uh, better control, get better control over U.S. imports in that, in that situation? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think this was uh, stated in terms of a number of ways. It is actually our trade policies and how we enforce them, uh, how we deal with these questions. You know, I, I know the author of the paper, Alan Tomlinson from USBIC, and I can tell you any a number of the things he would say. He would talk about uh, firsthand uh, you have to address currency manipulation as part of this. Um, but actually, the trade agreements we have in place, we don't enforce. We don't enforce our trade laws, and we need we need to do that, and we need to strengthen them. That's part of a multi uh, multiple approach to this because it's not just one thing, and there is no silver bullet to this. Um, in terms of China, it's more than just currency. They have all forms of illegal, illegal subsidies, the lack of enforcement of standards and laws in their own country around environmental and safety and health standards and worker rights. So it's a series of uh, actions um, that our trading partners engage in that we shouldn't stand for, frankly. And these things all act as incentives. It's not just the 40 percent on the dollar uh, currency incentive, but all these other things are incentives for manufacturers from our country and other countries to go to China to produce to access the American market, Thank short you. and simple. And we need to stop that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Fo, I mean, this is not just endemic to, uh, to China. And I, I've heard a lot about China today because I think they're a major source. But we have a number of other countries that are involved in the same types of practices, whether it's currency manipulation or subsidizing their industries, failure to enforce their own laws and regulations on environmental and safety and all of that. Are our trade agreements as they're currently structured? adequate for us to address these uh, situations? And if not, what, have, what must we do? The, the trade agreements are not. Uh, you might have to turn your microphone yeah. on. There. Thank you. And uh, as a matter of fact, they're misnamed. These trade agreements are not particularly aimed at trade so much as they are about allowing American corporations, multinationals, to invest overseas and bring the products back into the United States. Uh, we still call them trade agreements. But uh, you know, beginning with, uh, uh, with NAFTA and going through to the uh, uh, entrance of China into the WTO, we have consistently negotiated on behalf of American investment interests overseas rather than American production here. This now is built into our economy. For every 1 percent increase in incomes in America, we have a more than 1 percent increase in the trade deficit. So we have a ratchet effect going on now. And that's your point about the stimulus uh, is, is, demonstrates that. We have poured money not to create jobs elsewhere, but to create jobs in the United States in the midst of a, a recession. And a good deal of that, certainly hope, not all of it certainly, but a good deal of that just leaked out. The famous case in Texas with the with the solar panels, where uh, the, uh, the money was supposed to go for green technology. And it turned out that 80 percent of the solar panels were coming from China. Now, nobody designed that. It's now built into the way we run our economy. And that's why this is, uh, this is a multi-policy problem. Thank you. Mr. Gordon, uh, give us some short-term solutions to this. Uh, well, the short-term solution, I'll go back to what you talked about in terms of H.R. Uh, 4692. Just put your microphone just up a little bit. So There you go. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'll go back to the uh, 4692, uh, National Manufacturing Strategy. That will um, essentially take a, a good long-term view um, on what you can do in the short term for tax policy as well as uh, trade. But certainly intervention in markets which are distorted. Um, I want to I say one thing I heard you whisper. Wind turbines. Wind turbines were one of the things that also were funded. 
uh, hundreds of millions of dollars, and it went to foreign uh, manufacturers of wind turbines that were then brought back into the U.S. That is just something that did not at all meet the, uh, the purposes of the stimulus funds. Um, for Defense Department, there is a program such as the Title III program. This is the Defense Production Act Title III. And it is not simply for the DOD. It is for eight um, of the largest uh, Federal agencies. It is uh, authorities that can, I think they are found nowhere else, it is revolving fund authorities that would support um, any number of different national security industry capabilities within the U.S. Um, this is, a, this is one of the, the short-term actions that could happen if that was funded and actually um, implemented across uh, all of the agencies. Currently, there is a Defense Production Act committee that was just stood up in uh, January of this year, and they are trying to figure out how to use these authorities across energy, across national, uh, sorry, across homeland security, and in other uh, agencies. To this point, there can be uh, loan guarantees, production commitments, and other um, authorities that are used in order to um, essentially intervene in those capabilities and bring manufacturing back into the U.S. This directly combats the, uh, the offshoring because it provides to corporate, um, you know, to, to boardrooms, a required demand for the foreseeable future. And that takes the, uh, the uncertainty out of the decisions. And so, therefore, the offshoring equation now is unbalanced. And you can bring back to the U.S. or you can preserve manufacturing capabilities in the U.S through that Title III. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Lukemeyer, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me start with Mr. Wessel here. We haven't gotten to him yet. Um, you have in your testimony talked about uh, some of the um, uh, trade policies and your, your comments with regards to uh, uh, how we've gotten boxed in. What what do you see are some things that we need? I know uh, currency manipulation is one of your, your key items here. Is there something else in there we need to be looking at? Uh, what, do you, what do you see as a way we can uh, find a way, to, a balance here to be able to keep ourselves out of hot water with our, with our allies as well as be able to protect ourselves? What, what do you see we need to do? First of all, and thank you for the question. Um, all of this can be done in compliance with our international commitments. You must have some special powers. <laughs> Shedding light on the issue. Um, it, 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 all of this can be done in compliance with our international commitments. So we are not talking about WTO illegality or anything else. We are talking about, number one, enforcing our laws better than we are and creating confidence among manufacturers that actually there is a future here in America. Fifty-eight percent of China's exports come from foreign invested enterprises. Those are U.S. and foreign companies that have moved to China, in part hoping that they would be able to have a market to serve. But uh, for many of them, it's um, the products from the U.S. are industrial tourists that go into their facilities there and come right back. Uh, we've had haphazard uh, implementation and enforcement of our trade laws so that uh, our companies don't know where they should invest for the future. As you've seen in the papers recently, our companies are sitting on over a trillion dollars of cash. Now, if we were to take a set of policies to create confidence, one, that if you break the rules, there are going to be, uh, there are going to be repercussions for that, which, you know, it's, again, haphazard. Uh, number two, that we're going to have a set of domestic policies that make it clear that uh, whatever your views are on what are causing those, that there's a business climate here for the uh, employers to be able to make the investments, R&D, all the various other things we need to do. So it is a set of policies and a mindset that, quite frankly, has not existed for a while that needs to tell business, government, workers that uh, we're behind you and we're going to be doing this for the long term. In your view, if we would start enforcing the trade laws, which I've got a, a company that I'm well aware of and working on right now, that the individual spent over a million dollars of their own money to document a dumping charge against China, we can't get enforcement of the law. It's just it's ridiculous. But, I mean, if we would start enforcing the law and really hammering on it, what, do you, in your opinion, what do you think would happen internationally? Uh, are, are, is everybody going to start realizing that there's a, a new guy in town, a new sheriff in town, are going to start behaving themselves and respect us for that, or are we going to get ourselves in really big trouble? Well, despite my party affiliation, um, I think probably the president who did the best job on trade over uh, the last uh, many administrations was Reagan who basically said, you know, we're going to impl implement the rules, we're going to be tough, and we're going to stand up for American interests. 
This was at a time, as you may recall, when Japan was breaking the rules right and left. And as a result of that, with the Plaza Accord, with VRAs, with uh, what he did in the technology industry, with Semitech, and a number of other things, he basically said, we need to have a national security defense industrial base here. And the result was our trading partners ultimately realized that they couldn't get away with this. Japan, for better or worse, started moving many of their supply chains here. You know, as you know, last year they actually started fielding for the first time. Toyota did a uh, team at NASCAR. I mean, they've been Americanized in a lot of different ways. Our trading partners need to understand that we're serious about enforcing our rules. We're going to stand by them. We're going to stand by our companies and our workers. And it's not going to be a question of whether you have to influence the political system. If you're being damaged, you're going to get recompense. Okay. Um Mr. Fo, uh, you, you in your testimony have got a number of uh, uh, solutions here or suggestions of things that we need to do. Uh, can you uh, explain a couple of them and, uh, that you think are important or identify what you believe is the most important one of those solutions that can be most impactful and something we may be able to do for short term? That I see, Congressman, is that there is no place in the, in the federal government where this kind of discussion takes place uh, at, at the place where we can make policy. Uh, we've got these silos of policy making, and I think after so many years of continuous trade deficits, of this problem, as, as uh, Mr. Wessel said, beginning back in the 1980s uh, that uh, President Reagan understood, uh, so that we know that the organizational structure doesn't work. We need in the Congress, and I think in the, in the uh, uh, executive branch, we need a place where this discussion gets had and it, and it, and it connects with policy. My, dis my suggestion is for some, to begin with some presidential commission on national security, which includes economic security. We have to broaden the definition of national security beyond that of the Defense Department. Uh, second, I think there needs to be some parallel uh, reorganization in, in Congress. I suggested some select committee. Uh, you are a better expert on how all of that works than I am, but I know that we've got these silos here in Congress. Uh, one of my other suggestions is that the U.S. trade representative be taken out of the cabinet. I think what's happened in trade policy is that making trade agreements has become the measure of success or failure rather than trade policy in the service of U.S. national goals. And I think it was a big mistake to elevate the making of trade deals to the cabinet level. So I would start with those. Okay. Thank you. I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Welch, you recognize for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, and I uh, really appreciate the witnesses. Uh, you know, manufacturing obviously is important everywhere, related to defense, important everywhere, including Vermont. Uh, General Electric in Rutland is a big, big employer, and uh, people are always uh, anxious to hang on to those jobs. They do a great job in green aviation. But, you know, the thing that's uh, here, troubling me is this. We've got uh, a, a Republican leader here, a ranking member, and our chairman, Mr. Tierney, and I think they both uh, share uh, the objective that we have more manufacturing in this country. And there's probably across the aisle, both aisles, a lot of support for that in theory, but it doesn't happen. And uh, the question I have is what are the dynamics that are the impediment uh, to this Congress being able to do something uh, that whether you're in a red state or a blue state would be good uh, for the folks who are struggling uh, to have jobs. And I don't think uh, Mr. Foe, as much as, or Dr. Foe, as much as it uh, would be beneficial to have that kind of site to uh, concentrate attention that's necessary. I would agree with that. But my question is what are the dynamics that are making it from the perspective of those opposing real action? that makes it rational for them to oppose something that I think all of us at this table, Republicans and Democrats, think would be long-run beneficial for this country? Uh, if I can answer that. Uh, yeah, go uh, ahead. Husband. Go uh, down the line. I think one part of it is uh, the way economic policy uh, is nested in a view of economics that doesn't consider 
what it is that we make. Mm -hmm. And there's a long history of this. It, it, it uh, I think, started uh, after World War II when we didn't have to worry about what we were making. But today, at the highest levels of policymaking, whether it's under a Republican or a Democratic administration, raising this question in a small room without the press gets snickers and ridicule. Well, you're talking about the government intervening or in some way. Uh, and this is an ahistorical look at our country. From the very beginnings, as I said before, we had governments that were concerned about what we made in this country. Uh, and it, it started with Alexander Hamilton's famous uh, report on manufacturers. There's a, there's a wonderful story about uh, Franklin Roosevelt at the end of World War I when he was Secretary of the Navy. What he found out was that the British were buying up patents for long distance radio communication. The Marconi, they had invented it and they were buying up from the Italians and everyone else. Many of those patents were here in the United States in companies like Westinghouse, GE, and others. Franklin Roosevelt called them in. This was at the end of the Woodrow Wilson administration and said, we're not going to give this technology away. And so he got them to organize a corporation. The individual patent holders donated their patents and got equity from the, from the corporation. And that corporation was charged with developing long distance radio communication. It was called the Radio Corporation of America, RCA. And I am not a, I am not a military historian, but people I talk to tell me that the war in the Pacific in World War II would not have gone the way it was so easily had we not had the advantage of long distance radio communication over the Japanese. So this is, a, this is embedded in our history, but for uh, reasons that would take me a two hour speech about the sociology of economics and the influencing of, of the finance industry, which I think is part of this, uh, this is seen as something that's obsolete. Manufacturing is gone. We have to have a new kind of economy. Uh, I think we see where that's gotten us. And it's time to go back to our roots on this issue. Uh, briefly, I, I think there's a couple things that are very apparent here about the, the conflictual interest. One is the multinational corporations and the financial interests, which say go to the low cost producer overseas and do that and take advantage of all those things, the seduction of the low wages and the lack of uh, standards and the, the currency manipulation of China, et cetera, et cetera. And other governments understand this. China has a strategy. They're not the only one. So does Germany. So does France. I mean, all our other competitors actually have a strategy to put policies in place to encourage manufacturing and employment and income in their economy. We have done the opposite. All the encouragement has been through our tax policy to do this. So here in Congress, I sit as a partisan working from the, the labor side saying we need to do these things, but here in Congress we end up having this conflict where you find the transnational corporations opposing uh, action on these things. You find the, the retail, the large jumbo retail, the Walmarts of the world opposing doing things around currency manipulation. And you find the financial community saying no. And all this is directed towards short-term fast return as opposed to long-term investment dollars, which is one of manufacturing's problems. And I mean, I think it's part of the source of the conflict. It's some of the things we've got to come to grips with and address, and then change the incentive and investment patterns back to something that says we are investing in this country for the right reasons. We can be competitive. We are competitive. But we actually want to create jobs, income, and employment in this economy and be the technological leader. Thank you, Mr. Welch. Mr. Foster. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to um, ask what, um, to the whole panel what you think the, the large sources of leverage that we have to deal with the currency manipulation problem have and the relative merits of unilateral versus multilateral um, approaches to this. Because obviously currency manipulation is hurting you know, the Europeans and, and many advanced um, countries. Um, there's also a fairly well documented sort of dragging effect where the, um, the other uh, low cost um, Asian and South Asian um, currencies tend to follow the big dog in this, which is the Chinese. 
Um, and so that, that fixing the Chinese problem will naturally also cause the other competing currencies to move as well. Um, and so I was just wondering, you know, what you think the effective levers that we have to, to try to apply to this problem are. And I'll just go down the line. What we have left uh, is still the largest consumer market in the world. Uh, I don't know how long that piece of leverage is going to last. The Chinese eventually are going to build up their own sources of demand, and uh, uh, that's, that's uh, clearly uh, their long-term plan. So uh, I'm not sure that we have leverage left under WTO uh, rules, uh, and I would defer to, uh, to Mike Wessel on this. But it seems to me that the, uh, the efforts at persuasion uh, the efforts at telling the Chinese, which is often what we do when we go there, that it's better for them if they would uh, let, their, uh, let their currency uh, get back to more realistic uh, levels, uh, that that hasn't worked. So we need a two-by-four here, or at least a two-by-four behind, uh, behind uh, uh, our back. And the only two-by-four that I know that we have left is the U.S. market. So in some way, we have to ratchet up uh, our, uh, our determination to make it uh, too costly for the Chinese to continue this kind of currency manipulation. Thank you, Congressman Foster, for the question. I think there's a couple of things here, and I think uh, testimony brought it out uh, in the Ways and Means Committee the other day. I think you actually have to operate off your own piece of paper in negotiating, as Leo Gerard, the President of Steelworkers, said. You actually have to have a strategy and a plan and uh, as Teddy Roosevelt said, the ability to speak softly and carry a big stick. Um, we aren't doing that. We're just talking with no stick um, and no threat of action, nor actions having been taken that give uh, veracity to what you're trying to do at a negotiating table. What we do need is leadership in a number of ways um, that give you that. Uh, uh, Dr. Foe is absolutely right. The market is the number one thing. I mean, that's what everybody wants in this country. That's why other people want to come and do business here. That's why they want to import stuff in the United States. So that's, that's the one thing that we do have. But what do we do about in defending it and carrying our case forward? Action by Congress to pass legislation sends a strong message and provides some tools that we obviously need, since the Commerce Department says they can't find specificity in charges of currency manipulation of specific products. Well, let's fix it. We have a law to do that. Congress, congressional action sends a message to the people who are violating, and it is other countries. It's not just China. They're the poster child, but there's a whole series of countries, as I noted in my testimony, that are doing this. The second thing is take multilateral action. Absolutely. Engage with our partners and trading partners out there that are just as troubled. The intervention by the Japanese last week was a very, very serious move. They're troubled. So we should take multilateral action. We should take the unilateral action of passing legislation. We should engage in trade cases. We should consider the 301 case. It's not one tool or the other. It's all of the above that sets you straight on a path in negotiation so that when you sit down and talk to the other side, they're going to take you seriously. We've learned the Chinese will talk us to death. That's the role their government plays in this. And until they take us seriously, they will keep talking to us till the sun sets. Uh, I I agree, especially with the, uh, the multilateral. Um, when you have that type of uh, you know coordination and a coordinated response, uh, it, it's much more powerful. I'd also say that the Congress has a platform, and one of the ways of of using that platform in order to uh, deny or change the access to um, a very very large market is to really make the case to American citizens that when you buy from China with the currency manipulation, what is the harm that you are doing to this country? And that perception is a very strong perception, and it can probably sway markets more than um, a unilateral action or a, uh, a, a trade agreement. Quickly, and um, uh, there are staff here from the China Commission, so I'll ask them to validate my figures afterwards. We have leverage, as Jeff and others have pointed out. If I remember correctly, 22 percent of China's exports come to the U.S., 4 percent of our exports go there. We have, we have leverage. The Chinese leadership cannot afford what might come from um, conflict, trade conflict. 
Uh, there were 80,000 incidents of public unrest in China the, uh, the year before last, last time it was uh, publicly noticed. That's incidents where there are 10 or more people who are coming together to, to raise concerns. The Chinese leadership needs this market. And the answer is, while they will huff and puff and do everything else, if we are serious, we can put them on a path to eventual market-based currency. It's not going to happen overnight. I don't think anyone's asking for that. The question is, how do we put them on a sustained uh, course towards a market-based currency with confidence that it's going to change quickly enough? Um, I'm all for doing it multilaterally, but I'm not sure we have a lot of time left when we talk about what's happened to our manufacturing base, the confidence of our business people in terms of investments. Uh, if we take the full three years that could uh, it could take to go through a WTO action, uh, I don't know what's going to be left at that point. Thank you. Yield back. Thank you. Um, you know, interesting enough, Mr. Ba, you, uh, you were talking in your testimony about uh, the innovation being offshored, subsidies, uh, you know, money manipulation, things of that nature, and then you talked about Intel. Uh, and I think you said that Intel had gotten some uh, R&D uh, investment or whatever and had actually taken it offshore. Is that accurate? So it reminded me that just not too many weeks ago, Andy Grove, who uh, was what, one of the co-founders of Intel, uh, wrote an article in the New Yorker or New York Magazine or something on that basis where he basically called for a tariff. He basically said that we should take any product that is the result of cheap labor overseas and gets dumped onto our market at a disadvantage to our uh, companies, uh, assess a uh, fee or a levy on it, uh, take the money that's accumulated from that levy and deposit it in banks, but only those banks that agree to lend to only those businesses that agree to scale up uh, in this country, their, their research, development, and uh, manufacturing. So I'd be curious to know what the reaction of each of the panelists is to that, starting with Mr. Foe. I think that, uh, as Mike said, we are running out of time. If this was 10, 15 years ago, uh, we might have uh, answered that question with a more in a more deliberate way. But I think when Grove and Warren Buffett and, and other people uh, have come to the point, and these are, you know, nobody can doubt their free market capitalist credentials, when it's come to the point where they think that in order for this country to save its economic future, we have got to raise barriers if other countries don't play on an equal playing field. Uh, I think that's a signal that the members of Congress and this government need to pay attention to. The interesting thing is that um, uh, 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 someone like Buffett, who was a f financier and, of course, has is, is made a lot of money on the current condition, understands what this is doing to our basic uh, economic uh, uh, future. Uh, and th the movement away from this country is going on daily. Uh, a few years ago, the president of uh, Cisco Systems, CEO of Cisco Systems, said that um, said that what we are trying to do is outline an entire strategy of becoming a Chinese company. Now that was several years ago. I don't know how far along he is on that plan, but I'm sure he's more far along than he was then. So time, as Mike said, is not our friend. And uh, something uh, like the Andy Grove or the Warren Buffett proposal, uh, I think, needs to be surfaced right now and supported. And maybe then that will get uh, the Chinese attention. Thank you. Mr. Ba. I think it's a good idea. I think we should consider things like this. The whole point is to punish the behavior uh, of, of countries taking illegal practices. Uh, this form of punishment is a tariff on the money that then is plowed back into this economy to create good jobs and technology and secure our leadership. I mean, that's the fundamental thing, whether it's this proposal or another, that's what needs to be done. We need to be serious about it and we need to think at scale. Um, I, I wish we were hearing uh, more from current executives than retired executives. Unfortunately, I think the dynamic of the financial markets and the incentives are all the other way. And that's the kind of change we've got to come to in, in the course we've been on. We've got to find another path that changes that behavior, that changes that pattern, that changes those incentives so that they're made in our economy, not in someone else's. Mr. Gordon? 
Uh, I'd, I'd agree with conforming tariffs, especially as it brings uh, capital and productivity tools back into the U.S. Um, it's a natural consequence when you take manufacturing facilities and you offshore them that the next step uh, a year or two later is to put product development facilities right next to it so they can understand the manufacturing. And the next step after that is that R&D facilities are now moving out of the U.S. And, and overseas in order to be lined up in that area, and we need to stop that. Um, the chart uh, that Representative Foster put in earlier uh, showed a, a, a huge turn right around the 2000 uh, time frame, and there's no secret that that is the time period where uh, one sector in manufactured program uh, products, which is advanced technology products, all of a sudden started to look at a deficit in our trade, in our trade balance. So before that, advanced technology was a uh, was not a trade deficit, and since then it has gone down. And so what we see is we see all of our uh, seed corn in terms of R&D going uh, offshore. So if that tariff was to bring that back and put capital and productivity enhancements into manufacturing in the U.S., that would be successful. Thank you. If the, uh, my colleagues will indulge me, I'll ask uh, Mr. Wessel if his opinion as well. Uh, I think it's a great idea. I think that as the House uh, earlier this year looked at having border adjustment mechanisms regarding climate change, that the uh, right or the privilege of selling into the U.S. market uh, and accessing our consumer bears with it certain responsibilities, whether it's to address the questions of labor issues, labor rights, labor uh, uh, arbitrage, whether it's a question of bespoiling the environment, et cetera. Uh, our public wants to be able to maintain their standard of living and the quality of life, and they don't want it denigrated by a race to the bottom. So any mechanisms that can be put in place, serious mechanisms that will have a real impact, I think they're worth pursuing. Thank you very much. And thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Luchtemeyer. Absolutely, Mr. Chairman. Good questions. Um, I don't have a specific question for anybody right now. I just want to ask a question, and anybody can jump in on it here with regards to um, you know, to me, one of the things, and in my opening statement I made a comment that sensitive equipment should be made either in the United States or in collaboration with our closest allies. I think we've got a huge problem if we have sensitive equipment that we can't control the parts that make up that piece of equipment by, you know, a while ago somebody made the comment, and I know it's in testimony here somewhere, 97 percent of the rare earth um, minerals are in China. I mean, this is a huge problem for us. Um, uh, to me, at some point, we need to have some sort of um, legislation or rules or some sort of uh, agency that's able to not necessarily waive the rules, but be able to allow the rules to be put in place that allow us to produce uh, these or, or mine these minerals in our in our country here in a way that's economically viable as well as environmentally safe. I mean, I can't believe we can't do that in this country, but at some point, we've got to develop a policy. What do you What do you all think of something like that, and where do we need to start on that? If, if I can, let me, uh, first of all, I, I think your point is, is right on, and I think this committee, the subcommittee, uh, the jurisdiction will allow you to really look deeply into these supply chains. At the uh, China Commission, we had commissioned a report to look at what was happening with the defense industrial base and how it was dispersing. Uh, we had a classified contractor that was in charge of the study. They were unable beyond the Tier 2 suppliers, and if Tier 1 is Boeing, Tier 2 may be a, you know, a major system within there. Beyond Tier 2, they had no ability to get information on where things were. So uh, as the chairman noted about his uh, amendments in the past, whether it was with Mr. Hunter or others, you know, we've got to do a full assessment of what's happening with our supply chains. That's, that's number one. Uh, if you look at, for example, high tech, we have one trusted foundry left in the U.S. to be able to deal with, I think somebody raised EMP chips, radiation hardened chips, uh, et cetera. So we need to do a much better job of understanding the risks and then addressing them. And we're not, you know, information is the first thing that I think we need to look at. Anybody else want to? Tackle that, or yeah, Mr. Ball. Uh, yeah, I would just note that there is a bill in in, in the House currently. I, I, and I apologize, I don't know, the, I don't have the number. It doesn't come off the top of my head, but it was uh, a bipartisan bill. It actually looks at the rare 
rare earth metals. And it says we actually need to understand where this is. We need to develop a strategic supply for a period of time. We need to redevelop this industry in this country on that specific piece. But I agree uh, very broadly with uh, what Mr. Wessel has said, that we actually need an assessment of this base. Uh, we've been in the conversations. We don't know what's going on below, below Tier 2. And, uh, Mr. Chairman, you've made reference to some of the sort of scandals that have erupted when people found defective parts and defective materials. And what happened here? Well, we don't pay attention. And, and frankly, this is the nature of what's happened in manufacturing, where the people who used to make things as the prime contractors. I mean, when I was a kid, I went down to the Ford Rouge plant in Detroit, right? And you walk through those gates, they made everything there that went into a car. By the time I worked in the plant, we only made some of the things. By the years, by this century, things were outsourced, and then they were offshored. And this has happened across industries where the prime developers, it's been passed on to contractor, to subcontractor, to subcontractor. And, and we haven't, we've been living on a legacy of the way we used to make things as opposed to the way we do make things. Uh, and we need to get a better handle on that. Could I just uh, I, my time is limited, Mr. Fole. Just I got one more question here, and with regards to uh, Mr. Ball, you brought up the question here of the, the, uh, and continue to develop the um, the, the idea and, and the topic here of, of, of our industry, our manufacturing base is leaving. What, in, uh, in your judgments, is the things that we need to do? I know that there's uh, one of uh, when we talked about tax rates, labor policies, environmental regulations. Uh, are a problem right now. What do you see? What are your suggestions on how we need to get our manufacturing base back to this country? I think you need to do things on the trade front immediately to change that pattern of behavior and understand that we want to, we're going to enforce those laws and that, again, secure sort of the investments of the businesses into this country by having some surety of how we're going to do that. The second thing is to change the tax policies to direct investment into domestic manufacturing in a way that we are not doing. I mean, we have tax deferrals that allow corporations to hold these profits offshore. They are not invested in the U.S. economy. The last time people were allowed to bring them back and not pay much tax on it, they didn't invest in here to create jobs. So we need to, we need to change that behavior. We need to do what Secretary LaHood did. I, I commend him. Uh, him and Ron Bloom, our, our manufacturing person in this administration, they pulled together the high-speed rail industry or the rail industry, and they said to them, we are going to build high-speed rail in this country. We want to make sure we make it here. We're not going to grant waivers. We've got to bring the industry together to think about industry development, the ways we move forward, the things like that. So that's a form of leadership within government uh, that we have suggested that fits with what uh, Dr. Foe's talked about, what everybody's talked about, of a way of bringing focus towards the incentives and investment policies and bringing industry together to say, this is the way we're going to start doing business here and thinking and acting in a way like a business as a government. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Welch, you recognize for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much. I want to go back to uh, this question of how we can make some progress. Uh, you know, in listening to your testimony, it seems as though, in a very broad sense, uh, economic policies have favored the increase in the gross domestic product uh, as opposed to the reduction of uh, unemployment, uh, and that finance has triumphed over uh, uh, manufacturing. And the dilemma we have here in Congress is that uh, it doesn't seem that we can, even when we agree in the, uh, the long-term objective, we can't seem to agree on doing it together. Uh, so there's a real political impediment to doing things that are in our interest to do. So the question I have for a quick round of suggestions from each of you would be give two ideas that you believe potentially could have the support of Mr. Tierney and Mr. Lukemeyer who both share the objective of increasing uh, manufacturing employment. And I will start with you, Mr. Wessel. Um, I would give you a, uh, the first one, which I noted in my testimony, is making the R&D credit the R&D&D &D credit, the research de uh, development and deployment credit. We all want research here. We all want uh, innovation to occur here. We should also be moving to the next stage to make sure that that research is being applied in our own factories. Mm -hmm. Again, within the boundaries of international commitments, et cetera, and I believe it can be done uh, in a WTO uh, legal way. Um, I, another thing that I think we need to do um, is to... I want to get two suggestions from everybody. No, no. So, and yeah. uh, the other one is to address asymmetry in our law. That's a problem. Uh, it was mentioned the wind farm earlier today. Um, the problem with the Texas wind farm was we, pr we allowed uncapped money to go out and build wind farms, but we, did, we capped the money uh, to help develop the domestic supply chain. 
So you had all of these financial people going out here wanting to build a wind farm, but not enough domestic supply, and the result was they went out and bought uh, and made orders for Chinese goods. Uh, the President last December said, let's increase 48C, which was the domestic support, uh, and said $5 billion. We're still waiting for that. That's the kind of thing that we can uh, do okay. immediately to start revitalizing the supply chain. Thank you. Mr. Gordon? Uh, I would say, uh, overall, one of the things you want to do is you want to have that R&D investment come back, and that directly deals with the false perception that you can't be competitive while manufacturing in the U.S. It's just false. Um, one of the ways to do that, or one of the ways to build on it for national security, is to combine um, different functions within the defense industrial base assessments. Right now in the DOD there is industrial policy division that finds out where defense essential production is needed and then somewhere else where they implement things such as Title, uh, title III for capital investment or uh, Mantech for substitutes. We need to combine those things together into one implementation as well as uh, identification of those uh, capabilities. Thank you. Mr. Baugh. No surprise here. I think this Congress should pass currency legislation, a, co a bipartisan bill, the Ryan Murphy bill, that has 140 or more co-sponsors, uh, a lot of Republicans and Democrats together on this. It's simple. We should do it. That's number one. And I agree completely with this issue of asymmetry of policies and research and development. Um, every, this is the holy grail of the business community. R&D tax credits not to have to come back here and get this renewed every year. They want it made permanent, and the President has said that. I would say 25 years ago you could assume that that money for commercialization, R&D and commercialization, would be done in this economy. We would make it here. That is a false assumption today. You need to think like a state economic development agency that I, like I did when I used to run one, mm -hmm. help run one, is what's the return on the investment? Will that R&D investment create jobs in our domestic economy with people making the things we've invested in the R&D for? That's a simple question. It's something we should do, and it's something, frankly, that every other country does with their industrial policies. I met with the Japanese meaty folks a month ago, and they told me this. And they laughed when they said, we don't. Thank you. Dr. Fo. Uh, quickly, uh, I think the research and deployment issue is, uh, uh, is one of the uh, two most important. The other is currency. Uh, the currency manipulation and trade. I think that, uh, uh, that we ought to insist and have a timeline. I think the Congress ought to come up with a timeline that will get people's attention uh, for reducing the trade deficit dramatically with China. Uh, if we did that, uh, perhaps, again, we could get some serious discussion at the table. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, Mr. Murphy, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and, uh, gentlemen, I'm sorry I'm joining the hearing uh, late today. This is uh, as important an issue as this Congress is uh, going to talk about. Um, and uh, it, hit ho it hits home for each and every one of us. Um, uh, I'm going to maybe pose uh, an initial question to, to Mr. Wessel uh, by uh, means of an example. Um, I have a company in my district in Connecticut by the name of Ansonia Copper and Brass. It's the last domestic company that makes copper nickel tubing for the defense industry. Um, it's found on submarines but also on our entire ship uh, fleet. Um, they have one international competitor, uh, and uh, right now that company in Waterbury, Connecticut, is at risk of losing its remaining contracts with the uh, U.S. government, making a foreign supplier the only supplier of a critical element of our shipbuilding process to the United States uh, Navy. Uh, and uh, I guess this gets to a few issues, and I'll present them to Mr. Wessel. I I'm concerned about um, one m major component uh, of uh, our U.S. ship fleet being unavailable from U.S. suppliers. Now, currently, this company is a German uh, company uh, based in uh, Italy, uh, and so we can, I guess, have some relative sense of security that we're uh, hopefully not going to war with Germany or Italy anytime soon. But we don't really know too much about their supply chain and where it comes from. Um, we know that Ansonia Copper and Brass's supply chain was largely a domestic supply chain. Um, we know that the supply chain of their foreign competitor is largely a foreign supply uh, chain. Uh, and, and so I guess it, I'm happy to 
pose this question to the, to the entire panel. I imagine that although this is one specific uh, industry in which we could potentially lose total domestic capability, I imagine that there are others. I imagine that there are other um, uh, uh, major and important parts um, and major and important industries that may be non-existent or risk being non-existent here in the United States because uh, of uh, our over-reliance on foreign contracts. Um, and, and so I, I maybe pose that question first to you, uh, Mr. Wessel, and to, and to others. Um, w w are there um, elements uh, of uh, our manufacturing base right now um, that we are in, uh, in special jeopardy of losing? Are there um, areas of focus that this Congress should have in terms of making sure that we preserve manufacturing bases critical to the defense supply chain um, that may vanish in the next five to ten years or may have already uh, vanished with respect to this specific technology? Um, it could be gone within a year or two uh, and, and, and something that is not easy to create. Um, with respect to this specific type of, of tubing? Well, um, the answer is uh, I agree completely that we need to have domestic sourcing um, on anything that is a critical system where there is not, um, you know, a multitude of suppliers that we can ensure that our defense needs are met. Um, there is a large list of items I mentioned in my testimony, for example, the propellant used for the Hellfire missile. That is a, a missile launched from helicopters used as anti-tank. If there was a Taiwan scenario, for example, that may be a missile that people would want to use, that the military might want to use against landing craft as well. Uh, and we are going to be going to China to get the propellant. I think that that is probably a greater problem than Italy, although, as I also noted, with France denying overflight rights, with Switzerland, as the chairman noted, uh, refusing to provide products for JDAMs, uh, the fact is we can't be secure on anything unless we know that we are going to have a supply base here to be able to produce it. Titanium um, rivets for airplanes uh, was an issue two years ago under the Barry Amendment. So. Um, you know, my view is that uh, your manufacturing company should be getting the support of our own military and our own government to make sure that we have a secure uh, quality supplier that is going to have the ability to produce those goods for the future. It is vital to our national security. And then let me ask a follow-up, and again, happy to uh, mm -hmm. take uh, comments from the rest of the panel. What about that supply chain? I mean, what I worry about is that um, given the, um, I think, rapid escalation of parts and contracts being outsourced, we saw just from 2007 to 2008 in this country a 450 percent increase in the number of waivers that were granted to the Buy American Clause. So, I mean, that, that is an almost unexplainable increase in the number of waivers to our existing law, um, uh, how, how do, do we better track the supply chain when it starts maybe in a country that we are not as worried about like Germany, um, but can then go uh, into countries that we are much less confident about a long-term alliance with? How do we address that supply chain issue? I think it has to be addressed, quite frankly, by this committee and this Congress, that you have to make a question of supply chain integrity, globalization of supply chains um, a priority. In the, right after the Cold War, the military moved off of mil-spec procurement to what was called COTS, commercial off the shelf. And so they are just looking to find the cheapest way, cheapest price they can uh, do to, to obtain any good. We have to look at our supply chains and understand what is critical. We have what is called the MTCL, the Military Critical Technology List, MCTL. Um, uh, it doesn't go deep enough. It is not being enforced uh, aggressively enough. Uh, to Mr. Luca Meyer's question regarding, for example, uh, rare earth mineral, uh, CFIUS approved in 1996 uh, the sale of the last uh, rare earths uh, um, um, uh, company here that was um, making the uh, rare earth magnets, et cetera. Um, they made a promise that they wouldn't, uh, that they'd continue to produce here. Three or four years later, they moved all the production equipment to China. There was no after action review. So, this is a holistic issue, and we have to take national security a lot more seriously than we have been. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, would one of you volunteer to uh, explain the concept of offsets in the context of manufacturing and trade? I, I, I will take a, uh, a shot at it. Actually, I had recommended that uh, 
uh, that this is a committee at some time should talk with uh, one of my colleagues, Owen Hernstaben from the International Association of Machinists, who has written extensively and testified on this. He I testified mean, testified years ago in front of a, a subcommittee hearing as well. And he's he's testified in other committees too. I would, he, and he's written again on it recently. Um, and he's who I look to for advice and guidance on this. Very simply, and I may not get this completely correct, but the idea of offsets is when we do uh, defense contracting and sales to other countries. One of the questions is about where are parts going to be secured, where are these things going to be maintained, how much money is in that contract. And in fact, we're ending up spending more money or getting more money is being spent in the people that are buying it uh, in terms of the offsets than we are in our own country in producing these things. What this does is two things. Um, one, it builds up their capacity and capability around the production for those goods um, and, and capacity and capability to produce for that and all of a sudden become a producer um, as an ally of ours that co qualifies under Buy American rules. Uh, so it, it comes back to haunt us and bite us in a number of ways. So uh, I, I don't want to go any further because I, I, there's a good chance I'll get it wrong, Mr. No, but Chairman. the point I want to point out is that we do have uh, agreements where uh, people get a contract and the result of that is we end up obligated uh, to send them technology and then to buy parts and, and equipment and then bits them compete, uh, sometimes not even fairly, against our own operations on that. And that's an issue that we've addressed in past committee hearings, and we're going to have to address it again. Uh, one of the things I, we haven't talked much about is the manufacturing workforce and the fact that we don't seem to have enough college graduates and others pursuing science, technology, engineering, and math. And that's going to take a while to get that turned around. So I guess my question is, what do we do in the short term about the shortage of skilled personnel in the advanced manufacturing field, and what kinds of incentives can we give uh, to manufacturers to manufacture here in the face of uh, that apparent shortage? Well, Mr. Chairman, I believe that there's a number of things we can do. We actually have to put more funding into, into training and education, and both for the employed and unemployed. And I think uh, in your opening statement you noticed something, a phenomenon that is going on here that is also coming up very, very quickly. Uh, it, it is what we call the silver tsunami, and that's the fact that I'm a boomer like many people around here, and we're out of the workforce very, very soon. So that's a real challenge. At the same time, um, we have denigrated manufacturing in such a way that it's not attractive for young people to go in, and frankly, there haven't been jobs here, and we've lost millions in, in the last number of months in manufacturing. So that we've got to get around those impediments. And investments in that and our training and our technical education system are part of that puzzle. There's another part, too, that really has to make sure that we've got employers adequately investing in the training and the education of their workforce, too. It's not an either-or that they're just doing it or that the educational system is just responsible for it, but it's what the, both of them are doing together at the same time. Thank you. Yeah, we're in the process of reauthorizing the Workforce Investment Act, and uh, this is a major part of just how do we get uh, that cooperative effort between uh, labor, industry, academia, uh, technical schools and things of that nature to, to uh, get this turned around. Who's uh, One of the issues that we have, not just here, but also in energy technology and other areas, is getting the industries to uh, spend the time and the effort and uh, delegate the personnel to identify the standard of, of uh, quality they need out of workers. You know, what are the standards? What do they need to know to come in as a base level into your corporation that you can then take from there and apply that to whatever it is you do? <clears throat> and then determining who's going to write the curriculum and where. Is it going to be a, a technical school? Is it going to be at a community college? Is it going to be at a four-year college? Uh, is it going to be some private vendor on that and, and get that working on that gear? So if any of you have any comments or uh, improvements you think we can have as we reflect on that, uh, I'd like to, to hear it. If not now, I'm certainly accepted writing later. And, and Mr. Gordon, I know uh, you'd want to say something. Yeah, I did want to bring up one thing, just in terms of the first question and how we're going to get in there and whether people are interested in it. Well, there was a Price Waterhouse Coopers on, uh, survey on manufacturing about six months ago. And while in the high 70s and 80s, everybody agreed that manufacturing was important, it had good jobs, and it was great for national security, only 30 percent of those same people said that they would recommend that somebody in their family went into manufacturing. That's the problem. They believe that there's no future in it or that it's one of the three Ds. It's dull, it's dirty, or it's dangerous. If people understood in this country that it's a very, very clean, safe, and enjoyable and creative um, career, I think you would have more people going into it and more families pushing them into it. And I think that uh, an advertising campaign, much like U.S. Army or the Navy, where, you know, soldier of one, high tech, that's the kind of thing that will get people involved in it and say, I'm going to be part of building this, U this, uh, this nation. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lickmeyer, you have any further questions? Mr. Murphy. 
recognized. Mr. Chairman. Sure. Mr. Chairman, on the workforce issue, I would just note uh, I was visiting uh, another company in my district, uh, a district that has 9, 10 percent unemployment, uh, uh, an advanced manufacturing uh, aerospace uh, company um, who has had a help wanted sign. Uh, out for months now because they can't find the type of uh, tooling expertise that they need, even though we have uh, an enormous amount of our manufacturing uh, workforce base out of work, we don't have the high skilled type of workers that they need. Um, Mike, just one remaining question, and I'll maybe pose it to you, Mr. Foe, but also to Mr. Baugh as well, um, is this, how do we assess the true price of a particular contract when we are looking at a domestic supplier and a foreign supplier. Right now, um, the, the, the price is simply the contract price, that we will buy it overseas if it is a certain percentage cheaper than the contract that is offered to us by a domestic supplier. And though that certainly is an accurate assessment for a private company who is only responsible for paying the bill that they get sent, the U.S. government, I think, has a different calculation uh, because that contract being awarded overseas and by extrapolation, a job being lost in a U.S. manufacturing plant and then gained in a foreign manufacturing plant has other costs to the U.S. government. At the top of the list, obviously, the lost uh, payroll taxes, the lost income taxes, and then the increased social safety net costs of unemployment compensation and the like. Uh, and so I, I guess I it's a loaded question to an extent, but the question is, um, right now, we seem to simply award based on contract cost with no holistic understanding of the full cost of moving that contract overseas. How do we get, if, if we should make a change, and maybe I'll, I'm prejudging your response, but should we make a change, and if we should, how do you make that change, given the fact that we have the Department of Defense uh, making those decisions? Well. Uh, clearly, we need to make that change because that's basically at the heart of what we've been talking about uh, all morning. Uh, the social costs, not simply the employment costs and, and the, the costs of, uh, of government programs, but the long-term costs to the economic health of the United States are not included in that contract, even though the United States is the contractor. And the problem is no one is responsible for that. And for those in the government who care, and there are people who care, they have no access to the levers of power that would change that calculation. So the, the short answer is we don't have the calculation. We know that there are huge costs out there and huge benefits. And historically, as I said before you came, there, there's plenty of history here. But uh, we need to elevate that question to the highest levels of this government and public discussion uh, because leaving it, we have found that leaving it to the Department of Defense, leaving it to the Treasury Department, leaving it to the GAO, uh, who are not mandated to make that calculation, simply puts us back into this simple, narrow, and destructive uh, 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 obsessed with price issue. So, and, and historically, we've done that by some. Um, you know, fairly inartful requirements, 50 percent content from the United States with certain percentages of waivers, a um, percentage above cost that allows you above the contract offered in the United States that gets you out of that uh, by American clause. Is there a different way to force a calculation of the true cost to the U.S. economy? Is there a way to, um, for instance, add on um, a, a, a percentage increase to a foreign contract that accounts for all of those lost uh, taxes and increased government costs uh, to that job moving overseas. Is there just a different way of calculating the costs that we are not looking at today? Uh, yes, there is a different way. And the history of, of the, the literature on tariff economics is full of uh, formula and, and theoretical discussions on that. Uh, but I think our history shows that the most important thing was a change in the consciousness of the people writing those contracts and an understanding that there is this larger national interest floating on top of that, of that contract. And historically, we have been successful when uh, from at the very top of Congress and the executive branch, that message has gotten to the civil service and the people making those contracts. So it's not just how do I figure this out. It's my job 
is to figure this out. And if that's their job, the formula will come. Thank you very much. I have one last question. We talked about the rare earth uh, minerals and, and metals on that and China having 97 percent of that market. Is there um, a possibility or a likelihood that the United States could get some of that market back? And do we have the wherewithal to do it? And what time frame are we talking about getting to that if we were to start today? Mr. Wessel. Uh, well, first of all, as you may know, about two weeks ago, the steelworkers filed a trade case regarding the alternative and renewable energy sector. One of the five areas of action within that is to address China's uh, actions uh, and policies in the rare earth uh, minerals area, uh, which are clearly a WTO violation. So number one is that is to open up the market so we'll be able to get it. Number two, there are efforts to re reopen mines here in uh, the U.S. Uh, there's a mine that is presently under discussion for uh, California, as I recall, right near the Nevada border. Um, you know, there has not, because of the uncertainty in the market for so long, um, it hasn't been worthwhile to do it. Now that China is, is doing this, uh, has been, um, um, you know, withholding so much, uh, it's becoming economic to do it here again. But as I believe Mr. Lukemeyer may have said, it's going to take 15 years not only to get the mine back and operating, but also to be able to transform those items into products that we can use in the gr clean and green chain in JDAMs and everything else. So we can take action, but the first thing is we have to get China to change its policies. Great. Thank you. Uh, if there's anybody on the panel that believes we haven't addressed a matter that, uh, that needs attention, uh, I would like to give you one opportunity to, to state that for us. Otherwise, uh, we'll wrap it up. Mr. Foe? Just a quick footnote on the training question. Uh, one of the problems here is credibility. For the last 20 years, uh, with the, with the, the government and, and other leaders have been telling uh, young people that get into computers, get into this sort of technology, get into that. And it turns out that in many of these areas, the supply of workers is much greater than demand. So there's a confidence issue both in the labor market, that is to make it clear to people that the that there is government policy to create those jobs and to create a, a dynamic sector, uh, both for the labor market and for the financial markets to get the investment. Thank you. Anybody else? Mr. Gordon? Yeah. I'd like to add one other comment on uh, Representative Murphy's uh, um, interest in how you uh, add costs or, or take into account to offshoring. Uh, right now in federal procurement policy, you have a source selection criteria, and that source selection criteria does not allow for you to understand what happens or take into account what happens to domestic manufacturing capabilities. That means that a program manager that is making those decisions is not allowed, even if he understands those, those consequences, is not allowed to make a decision for a domestic versus an offshore supplier, and that is a barrier to making that right decision. The Aerospace Industries Association has an industrial based report that they put out that said we should add what happens to industrial capabilities on the domestic front as a source selection criteria when um, it is defense essential needs. And that would take care of that. I would also add uh, the same point. We have sug suggested over and over that we really do have sort of a social impact cost on these things about the employment side, the income side, uh, which you have been getting to with your question, Mr. Murphy. Um, and frankly, I would note that the industrial policies of most of our competitors, whether they are communist or whether they are uh, democratic societies, um, they actually do have strategies for manufacturing, and it is based upon the desire to have employment and income and technolo technology in their society and to be making those things. Uh, we are the only ones that really don't. So it is not just about twisting ourselves into a pretzel to find a cost accounting mechanism to get it to it. It is also about uh, uh, the broader overview of how we think about manufacturing. It is not just the consumer interest. There is a vast society interest and an employment and income interest. Thank you. Mr. Wessel. Just quickly, uh, many years ago there was a bill called the Save American Jobs Act, which looked at the offshoring or outsourcing of production and basically said, we are going to look at the cost that you were leaving behind. So if a company is going to look at moving its operations or so sourcing offshore, the public has a right to know what costs are being left behind, whether it is diminution of the tax base, whether it is unemployment benefits, welfare, or anything else. Uh, and there is a way of doing that to look almost at a severance tax, if you will, if you are going to pick up and leave, and, and uh, which could be done in the defense area as well. 
And so when the internal rate of return is looked at by a company as to what their return is when they move operations, they're going to have to factor in the cost of those people that they leave behind. And that's something I would suggest be looked at. Uh, it hasn't been brought up in many years. I want to thank all of our witnesses again for your testimony. It's been extremely helpful to us, and I hope that this is not the last hearing that we have on this issue, and we uh, like to give a little bit of impetus to our colleagues and other committees to get moving on this as well as the White House. And thank my colleagues and staff as well. Meeting adjourned. Ladies and gentlemen, judges, this is Shelby Schaefer. She stands a really good chance of walking away the winner today. Three people's opinion is going to make up the final end result, and hopefully that's your last We have an amazingly competitive group here. Each judge scores one to ten in each of the three categories, and the girl with the highest score is the winner. I minutes. think the, the Casey Taylor, the little doll that came out in the doll box, I thought that was precious. I love the first contestant in the um, coral cowgirl outfit. Mm -hmm. I mean, she was absolutely beautiful. The contestant that came out with the yeah, snake on her neck, yeah. she didn't go with the rhinestones, she didn't go with the sparkles, she didn't go with the $1,000 outfit. She bought a live snake. I thought it was a gimmick. It basically took away from the fact that she really wasn't doing anything else. And we had tons of personality yeah. and really worked the stage. And I loved it. Great face on her. I Beautiful can't take face. my Same eyes off of her face. Yeah. Certainly not a runaway for anybody in it's my not. eyes. If I could have all of the young ladies back out on stage, the crowning ceremonies are ready to begin. Round of applause for all of the young ladies. Crowning is always a tough, tough place to be because some dreams aren't realized. Okay, these are the top five in no particular order. Ladies and gentlemen, our first top five finalist, Mary Ashton Klinger. Our next top five finalist, Clayson Cody Crampton. Kev Baker. <laughs> Our next top five finalist in no particular order. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Hadley Campbell. <laughs> One spot remaining in that top five. One spot remains. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the elite group in the top five. Contestant number 14, Casey Taylor. <laughs> Let's hear for all of the young ladies competing today in a brilliant fashion. We have written a song specifically for this pageant. It's called Little Miss Perfect. The Little Miss Perfect pageant 
where all your dreams come to rule the little miss perfect pageant where the special one is a you there are citrus colored rainbows on the other side hop on your magic carpet and take a natural ride if you think it and want it dream it then it's real you are what you feel ladies and gentlemen the top five finalists little miss perfect in a very particular order our fourth runner-up clayson cody crampton the third runner-up for the title of little miss perfect casey taylor Second runner-up, ladies and gentlemen, Mary Ashton Klinger. If I could have the two remaining young ladies come down to the end of the stage. Today's first runner-up for the title of Little Miss Perfect is... Kiev Baker. And today's Little Miss Perfect. Let's hear it for Hadley Campbell. I'm very proud. She pulled it off. She really kicked some butt today. Hadley Campbell being crowned Little Miss Perfect. Come on, let's go. It doesn't matter. Shelby performed her best. I couldn't ask for a better performance from that child. If the judges don't want to look at her, this will be officially Shelby's last competition. Now I have to go home and explain to my little girl why the judges didn't think she was pretty enough. You are the best. I'm so excited. Are you so happy? Was it worth all the hard work? It was. It was a win for Hadley. It was a win for her mom. It was a win for her pageant family. But at the end of the day, she is the one who put herself through the motions to get it. So at the end of the day, she goes to sleep the beauty queen. I want to hold my flowers. Let's do it this way. This way, real quick. I am beyond words. I think that... Um, Hadley works really hard in the five days um, to do this, and she's worth every ounce of the energy and the love that everybody gives her. I won a title, and I won a big check, and my new title is Little Miss Perfect. Did you have fun today? Yep. You did a really good job. There weren't too many little girls that would take a snake up on stage. Alexa, I'm a beauty queen and so is my mom. A round of applause for all of the mother and daughters. My name is Kendall. My mom and I are beauty queens too. Hey y'all. This is team number three. Being a beauty queen takes tons of hard work. Looking at the judges, five, six, seven, eight. We have to practice our routines over and over again. Kendall, we have to learn a routine in a week. I'm very concerned about how the dance is going to look on stage. But it's worth it because we get to dress in really fancy clothes. I got first place in this dress. Welcome everybody to Little Miss Perfect! It's horrible. There's no planning. The outfits didn't match. All of us want to win, but only one team could be crowned. Little Miss and Mrs. Perfect. Today's winners, ladies and gentlemen, 